It is good to be with you tonight. I hope you're all doing well. I'm uh, coming to you from my, I guess you'd say, study on the southwest side of Madison. I can just barely hear the traffic from Highway 151, Verona Road, way off in the background. I guess, I don't know, no leaves on the trees. And a sound travels through here right now. It's raining outside. This is about 11.30 a.m. on Wednesday as I'm recording this. And uh, happy spring, I suppose I should say, because uh, overnight tonight, at some point today or in the overnight hours, all of this is supposed to change to uh, snow for an inch or two. And I was talking to one of our members of the church on Sunday on the way out uh, about how we enjoy all the seasons here in Wisconsin. There really isn't a bad one. Uh, A lot of things to be thankful for, no matter what season that we're in. But I'm thankful for the changes that we see around us in terms of the changing of the seasons. God gave us a beautiful world in which to live, and I am very, very thankful for that. And right here in my office, my study, I am surrounded by greenery. I feel like I'm coming to you from a a jungle. I wish I could kind of turn the the camera around, but uh, a year or two ago, my daughter uh, rescued a a huge monstera plant, kind of like a shuffalera, a little bit different, but a huge plant, and it uh, had some issues. uh, overgrown, going everywhere, and so I started taking cuttings, and we broke it off, and we uh, got things started, and, and I am now surrounded by these things, so there is greenery everywhere. I have to fight through the jungle to turn the studio lights on in here and shut the blinds and all that, but uh, anyway, a lot to be thankful for. Hope to see you this coming Sunday at 9.30 for Bible class. I believe we're still in First Timothy, so come prepared for First Timothy. And uh, we were in chapter 5 this past Sunday with uh, the care of widows. I believe, uh, I haven't read it again just recently, but uh, taking, uh, removing a bad elder, I think, is coming up in the, the rest of this chapter. So I hope to see you this coming Sunday at 9.30 for class and then 10.30 for worship. We plan on wrapping up our study of what happens when we die, where do we go when we die, and some special questions that have come in from members of the congregation. And I'm looking forward to uh, those remaining questions this coming Sunday. Uh, tonight... We are continuing in our brief series of lessons on prophecy in the Bible. We're hitting the highlights. We're doing just an overview in between our study of Acts and Genesis. So this study is something of a buffer between those rather large books. And we usually don't do topical uh, studies on our Wednesday class, but this is an exception to that. And as you remember, if you've been with us over the past six weeks or so to help keep us on track, to give us a sense of direction and progress, we're putting a rough outline on the left side of the screen. We started with the basics. A prophet is somebody who's a spokesperson for another person, in this case, a spokesperson from God. And sometimes these men and women had the ability to foretell the future. We looked at some principles of predictive prophecy. We looked at some examples of prophecy starting at that point um, concerning nations. And then we looked at some prophecies concerning individuals and then God's kingdom, the church. We learned Psalm 2, Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, and Joel 2 are all fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, which makes that very easy to remember. And then we moved into some prophecies concerning Jesus. And really, this is where the class started. A few months ago, I was thinking we need to look at these prophecies about Jesus, but kind of before we could get there... We needed to establish the basics. We need to go back and look at those principles. And then these other examples kept popping up. So that has been the structure we're ending with Jesus. So up to this point, over the past couple weeks, we've looked at his birth as well as his life. And then next week and tonight, we plan on continuing this study by looking at some of the prophecies concerning the last week leading up to the crucifixion as well as his death and his resurrection. We'll get to those two parts uh, next Wednesday if the Lord wills. And we um, will start on the Sunday morning before the crucifixion. So we are uh, one week out from his resurrection at this point. This is a prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. Zechariah 9 verse 9 where the prophet says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so I just want us to notice in this little passage, we have rejoicing, we have shouting, We have the king arriving, bringing salvation. He is humble. He'll be uh, riding on a donkey, but not even a a full-grown donkey, (laughs) not a majestic donkey, we might say, but uh, on a colt, the foal, or the the young offspring of a donkey, if I understand that correctly. And obviously, uh, this would be pretty unusual, wouldn't it? Kings would uh, arrive in a town on a horse, wouldn't they? Or maybe a, a carriage or a chariot of some kind. But this king would arrive in a a vastly different way from all others. So for the fulfillment of this prophecy, 
We turn once again to the book of Matthew. Remember, Matthew's written to the Jewish people. And they really cared about prophecies like this. They would have been very familiar with this. So not so much with the Romans and the Greeks reading Mark and Luke. So let's look at Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Matthew 21, 1 through 11. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them. And he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Well, I think most of us are familiar uh, with this account, uh, especially here in Madison. There's a nationwide atheist organization. They have an article, if I remember correctly, on their website, at least it was years ago accusing Jesus of being a horse thief. And um, so he must not be the son of God because he steals horses. He told his disciples he's colluding in this to to steal his donkey. And of course, we talked about this uh, a few times through the years. That is not the case just because we don't know the background and the arrangement that was made behind the scenes doesn't mean that he was really stealing this donkey. But anyway, he apparently he knew stuff. He sent his disciples in, get this donkey. The donkey comes out and uh, then he rides into the city on this, uh, on this donkey. But I'm just saying in our study tonight, this is a good example of prophecy being fulfilled. So notice we've got the passage in Zechariah written around 520, 518 BC or so. And then we have Matthew with the quote. And as Matthew often does, he says, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. So this isn't just some random verse that people decided after the fact to apply to Jesus, but this is inspired. This is God's stamp of approval on this. In other words, this is what I was talking about when I revealed this many years ago to Zechariah the prophet. Well, as we think about um, Jesus being betrayed, and that's kind of where we're heading here, I want to note several passages predicting that Jesus would be rejected. So before we get to his actual betrayal, I think we may need to back up just a little bit. And, uh, and just note that the Messiah, the coming king, would be rejected. And we have a hint of this in Isaiah 53, verse 3. And uh, this is where Isaiah speaks of the coming Messiah. So here in this last week of his life, that's kind of why I've saved that until now. In terms of him being rejected, it doesn't get much worse than his crucifixion. So this, I just need to point this out that this was predicted. This was not a surprise. Uh, the Lord certainly anticipated this. He saw this coming. This is Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. So I just hope we notice here, I want to emphasize here the idea that Jesus would be despised and forsaken. He was a king. He was the son of God, but many would turn away from him. They would not accept him as being their king. There is a similar thought that comes through over in Matthew 21, verse 42. In Matthew 21, 42, in terms of Jesus being rejected, notice Jesus is quoting from Psalm 118. In uh, Matthew 21, 42, Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So I would just note there that Jesus would be rejected by those, especially by those in positions of authority. And yet he would end up eventually becoming the chief cornerstone. He really always was, but uh, they just didn't see him as that. Uh, The thought continues down in Mark 8, verse 31. In Mark 8, 31, this is... This is something of a rather short-term prophecy, Mark 8, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things 
and be rejected by the elders and the chief priest and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So here he's kind of uh, repeating the prophecy and he's giving this information from the past saying this is about to be fulfilled. So that's how I would take this. And then we have Luke's account of this, a little bit uh, more of an extended account in Luke 18, 31 through 34, Luke 18, 31 through 34. Then he took the 12 aside and said to them, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and all things which are written through the prophets about the son of man will be accomplished for he will be handed over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day he will rise again. But the disciples understood none of these things, and the meaning of this statement was hidden from them, and they did not comprehend the things that were said. And so again, here's uh, Jesus kind of making a maybe mini prophecy of his own. This is just a few days away. And yet this is really nothing that he can control, especially as to the exact timing of it and exactly the, the manner of his death and exactly what would happen. So I think this would qualify as a prophecy in this category of him being rejected leading up to his crucifixion. Uh, not only would he be rejected by the religious leaders, but he would also be abandoned by his closest followers. Over in Matthew 26, 31, Jesus quotes another prophecy made in Zechariah. This is Zechariah uh, chapter 13, verse 7. And in uh, Matthew 26, 31, he quotes this. Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. So there's Jesus taking this prophecy from more than 500 years in the past. And he's saying basically this will be fulfilled right here in the very near future. Um, as we get closer to Jesus' death, we come to his actual betrayal which is predicted several times in the Old Testament, starting with the brief reference in Psalm 41, verse 9. Psalm 41, verse 9. This is where David is describing his enemies and false friends. And he says, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And we might think, oh, that's kind of interesting. Well, that's kind of a weird coincidence. Um, but it probably only applies to King David. You know, that's kind of the initial thought here. It's kind of a, a strange coincidence, but probably just David, probably not Jesus. And, you know, everybody has his enemies. Everybody has this unfaithful friend here and there. All of us have been uh, betrayed from time to time. But then we turn over to the New Testament and we see an interesting fulfillment of this prophecy starting in Matthew 26 verses 21 through 25. Matthew 26, 21 through 25. As they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And he answered, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. And Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. Okay, so I hope we notice the, uh, the, the one who dipped his hand with me in the bowl. The custom was to dip bread in oil. I think if you've been to some Italian restaurants, they'll have the the little plate of oil with the pepper and all that on it, and you dip the bread, rip off little pieces, and so on. Kind of a similar thought there. Well, it's interesting. Um, Jesus' betrayal is tied to eating bread. So we're getting a little bit closer there. Again, maybe just a coincidence. Uh, but then we come to another reference in Luke 22. And this is Luke 22, verses 21 through 23. Luke 22, 21 through 23. But behold... The hand of the one betraying me is with mine on the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to discuss among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this thing. So again here, not a direct reference to bread, but there is a reference to the betrayer's hand being with the Lord's hand on the table. So they were sitting near each other. They were sharing that bowl. They were sharing the bread that they were eating. And then we come over to John chapter 18. John 18. And we'll notice John 18 verses 18 through 27 where Jesus says this, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, 
But it is that the scripture may be fulfilled, he who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' bosom or at his side, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, Tell us who it is of whom he's speaking. He, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus then answered, That is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan had entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. So here then, John very clearly says that what Judas does here is the direct fulfillment of prophecy. And that this happened not only to fulfill prophecy, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. And he quotes Psalm 41.9. And not only does he quote it, but he says, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. And then John describes what happens with Judas for the purpose, I think, of, of documenting this as proof that David's words are fulfilled in what Judas does here. So the goal is to use this prophecy and specifically to use the fulfillment of this prophecy to create belief in Jesus as the Son of God. This is the whole purpose of the book of John. And so that's why this is included. So here the fulfillment of prophecy is documented specifically as a way of pr proving that Jesus is who he claims to be, that he really is the Son of God. So it's kind of an interesting use of prophecy. Uh, connected to this, we also have an interesting prophecy concerning the betrayal itself. This is back in Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. Zechariah 11, 12 and 13. I said to them, If it is good in your sight, give me my wages, but if not, never mind. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Then the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. And I think as soon as we read this, we, we know what this is about, don't we? We understand this. If we know the scriptures at all, this is very familiar. Uh, we have an interesting twist, I would say, in the fulfillment of this over in Matthew 27, 1 through 10. And I, I hope we'll keep an eye out as I read this, as we look at it together on the screen or in your lap or your device at home. But I hope we keep an eye out for Matthew's citation of this prophecy. This is Matthew 27, 1 through 10. Now when morning came, all of the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death, and they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate the governor. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? See to that yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed. And he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest took the pieces of silver and said, It is not lawful to put them into the temple treasury, since it is the price of blood. And they conferred together, and with the money bought the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then that which was spoken through, the prophet, through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of one whose price had been set by the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. So I hope you caught that. And I hope you noticed here Matthew attributes this prophecy not to Zechariah, uh, but to Jeremiah. And I know some have assumed that we may be dealing with some kind of a, a scribal error here. Not necessarily that Matthew made a mistake. That's not what happened but that Matthew originally mentions Zechariah, but maybe the scribes that were copying the book of Matthew through the years, they might have accidentally switched the citation to Jeremiah, who would have been probably a far more popular prophet than Zechariah. So they think prophet, they just kind of inserted Zechariah, and then that got copied, and that got copied, and so on through the years. Well, that, that's a possibility. However, another possibility is that Matthew is actually quoting Jeremiah. 
but it's from some writing by Jeremiah that we no longer have with us today. And I say that because we look through the book of Jeremiah and we don't find this in here. So this is not from the book of Jeremiah as we know it. And so either it was a scribal error changing that citation or uh, Matthew really was quoting Jeremiah and he just was quoting from some source that they had then that we don't have now. Or it could have been straight up from inspiration. Either way, um, it, it seems rather obvious that Judas is betraying Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and that that was obviously predicted beforehand, um, as is the connection of this payment to a potter as the silver was used to purchase the potter's field uh, in the book of Matthew. Well, I'd like for us to wrap it up tonight with the prophecy that Jesus wouldn't really defend himself leading up to his death on the cross. And so we're not, we're right up almost to the moment uh, of his crucifixion. But for this, we go back to Isaiah 53, verse 7. Isaiah 53, 7, where the prophet says, with reference to the coming Messiah, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. And so this would be very unusual, wouldn't it? This is not the way uh, this normally happened. Usually if somebody's falsely accused and facing the death penalty, they would defend themselves, they would call out, they would yell, they'd scream, they'd get people's attention. You know, this injustice is happening, this is not right, save me from this, that kind of thing. They, they would at least try to speak up and make a defense. Uh, but as we know, Jesus does not do this, does he? I mean, he says a few words here and there, I think making points, trying to convince people, um, kind of putting people on notice, but there's really nothing in terms of a defense. So we see this fulfilled over in Matthew 27, four, uh, 12 through 14, Matthew 27, 12 through 14. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. So the governor was quite amazed. And to me, that is amazing. Isaiah predicted this 700 plus years before it happened, that Jesus would not uh, make a verbal defense at the time of his death. Well, this brings us to the end of tonight's study. Basically, tonight we've looked at Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We've looked at the prophecies that Jesus would be rejected, not just by the religious leaders and by society in general, but also by his own people. He'd be betrayed by a close friend. Even that was prophesied, sharing bread at the table, that kind of thing. The prophets even predicted the 30 pieces of silver and how that silver would ultimately be used. All these are out of Jesus' control. Uh, we then looked at the prophecies that Jesus would be silent with regard to his own defense, which was perfectly fulfilled in his trial. And we'll leave it there. We'll plan on wrapping all of this up next week with some prophecies concerning the Lord's actual death and his resurrection. Feel free to read ahead. I know Psalm 22 is a key one there. We'll probably go back to Isaiah chapter 53 uh, and a number of others. And I'm looking forward to uh, finishing this study, if the Lord wills, next, next Wednesday evening. I uh, hope to see you this coming Sunday at 9.30 and 10.30. But as we close tonight, let's all go to God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of all grace, the Father of comfort, the creator of light itself. You know all things, and we're thankful tonight that you have revealed your knowledge to us in Scripture in a way that points us to your Son. We're thankful for your servants, the prophets. We know that many of them were constantly harassed, even put to death, for speaking what you commanded them to speak. In light of their courage and sacrifice, we pray that we would never be ashamed of your word, but that we would believe it and that we would share it with others courageously and without fear. Tonight, we ask your blessing on the seniors of our congregation. As they're challenged with various forms of pain and loss, we ask that you would comfort them as you have promised to do, and we ask specifically that you would use us in that process. We're thankful for good Christian friends and for the encouragement that they give to us. Father, as we close tonight, we'd like to ask that you deliver us from temptation. Protect us from the evil one. We come to you tonight in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.